We are absolutely honored and delighted tonight to welcome WAFB's Jacques Doucet, one of your favorite, my favorite, LSU media icons, media luminaries. This guy's been doing it for two plus decades. Um, absolute brilliant community man as well. We got it. We got to welcome in Jacques Doucet. How are you doing, my rock and roll brother? <laughs> Well, I appreciate that very, very kind uh, introduction, man. Great to be with you on your uh, on your show today. How are you doing, Jacques? How's it been covering the show? Thank you so much for 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 spending a little bit of your time with us. We we know how how busy you are throughout the season. Well, happy Thanksgiving to you and uh, your little one and your wife and all that stuff. And I uh, hope you don't freeze up there in the great uh, what we call that Pacific Northwest. That's where you're at right now. Yep, yep, the Great Salt Lake. Yes, indeed. It's uh it's been snowing. It's been getting crazy up here, Jacques, already. And uh yeah. happy Thanksgiving to you as well. Uh hopefully yeah. you'll be able to make the trip to, to Lafayette, right? And see the Yeah. Pulp. I'm gonna go see some family in Lafayette uh tomorrow for Thanksgiving, and then it's uh it's on the road to College Station, Texas, a place I've been uh many times over the years to cover LSU football, uh lawn. Certainly some uh crazy moments there over the years. Uh, 2016 that was the game where we didn't know who the head coach was going to be and uh, it looked yeah. like it was going to be Tom Herman and uh, that was on Thanksgiving night and then by Saturday morning it was Ed Ogeron being introduced at a noon press conference yeah uh 2018 was a seven overtime game we all remember that uh which LSU fans felt like they won the game seven times before uh <laughs> it uh it went A&M's way yeah and then 2020, Lon, uh, not to give you a, a big, uh, you know, his, historic recap, but. Uh, I want them. I want it. Uh, I was there for that one as well. Um, I think probably with the biggest COVID crowd that year, I think they said 17,000 or something. And things are a little more lax in Texas. So some people said, ah, it looked like we're like 25 or 30, but uh, that was a rough night for TJ Finley and the Tigers. So we'll see what happens this time. Man, I, I mean, that's that's hilarious that every time in college station, it has been a wild game. It has been a crazy game with a lot of momentum shifts and weird, just weird things going on. We've had Texas A&M's number before this uh, recent two and two split on the series uh, winning. I think it was nine in a row before then. Um, but really Jacques, we're also, we, I mean, we got to welcome you in the, the proper way, Jacques. We got to <laughs> welcome you in the proper way. You say, number one Sammy Hagar fan in the world. <laughs> See I, I mean, this is someone I'm welcoming in who, who's got my full undivided respect. Recent birthday boy as well, Jacques Doucet, celebrating a birthday. Happy birthday to you, my Scorpio uh, brother as well. This is one of my favorite. So my friend Avery Davidson years back, this is called Vinyl. This is, uh, you know, they used to play records. And uh, if you rank the Van Halen albums, a lot of people have put this one towards the bottom. But it's one of my favorite pictures. This is OU812 with Sammy there and the late, great Eddie. Uh, rest in power, Edward Van Halen and Alex, his brother, and Michael Anthony. Anyway, I I've always loved this picture. That's the OU812 album from 1988. But the, uh, the great Van Halen fans will put this one lower. You know, the David Lee Roth stuff, look, I'm, I know the whole catalog backwards and forwards, and I get – David Lee Roth era is pretty bulletproof. I mean, it's awesome music. You you know I'm a D, I'm a David Lee Roth guy first and foremost when it comes to Van Halen, but I got to respect and love, you know, what Hagar brought to the picture. I mean, Sammy Hagar, you know, that fronted version of Van Halen, that's the that's really the first Van Halen that I saw in live in concert 2004. And that was a wild tour with a with a Eddie kind of Hitting you hitting the sauce, but I mean, he's still you wouldn't you I couldn't tell he was playing like out of his mind. But I'm glad you brought up OU8 OU812 because uh, when it's love, you know, Cabo Wabo, I mean, finish what you started. I saw Sammy Hagar did a uh, a duet the other day with John Mayer and they played uh, finish what you started. They had Tommy really? Lee on the drums from Motley Crue, it was really cool. Really, yeah, I need uh, to see this. Uh, yeah, that's it. What? it's online there but yeah you know i mean not to not to bore your fans with the van halen stuff but i mean you know david lee roth this first uh the six albums with him 
the first four fans would say are, are just a relentless attack. I mean, you've got Romeo Delight and The Cradle Will Rock and, uh, you know, the first album alone with Ain't Talking About Love and um, Atomic Punk and Little Dreamer. and I'm the one. I'm the one. I mean, just kind of reinvented rock and guitar and all that. <clears throat> And then by 1984, which is probably the biggest album they ever did, you know, yeah. commercially at the height of MTV and videos, Jump obviously is the biggest song they've ever done. You know, a lot of Van Halen fans will say, oh, Jump sucks. That's not really Van Halen. But, um, you know, Jump, Panama, Hot for Teacher. And then Sammy yeah. Hagar was in a real tough spot. I mean, it, David Lee Roth is probably the biggest rock star in the world at the point, And he steps yeah. in and it's more commercial, more top 40, more not as, you know, a lot of keyboards in there, a lot of love stuff. But uh, four straight number one albums and, uh, you know, millions and millions sold, kept the thing running for another, you know, whatever years. I used to say kind of less miles was a lot like Sammy, like he was more successful than his predecessor in many regards. But then the fans always wanted the other guy to come back, you know, <laughs> so it was a little similar in that regard. I love that. Uh, uh, literally just comparing Les Miles and Nick Saban to, to Hagar and Roth. I mean, this is, this is, this is where you, this is where you come to get it all guys, guys uh, yeah. and gals, LSU odyssey.com where you got Van Halen and LSU meeting at the crossroads of life. That's what we're talking about. I mean, this Jacques, I mean, I, I hate to toot your, your, your horn, but I'm just going to, I mean, don't feel shy about this. You're a two time Emmy award winner. You've evolved and grown in this job over the years i mean but since you know you're you're tracking them down every day the next big interview or story you know you don't ever sit back kind of take stock of what you've accomplished over the years well now you've got brian permission to do that tonight Jacques. <laughs> Grow, growing up in lafayette you know going to high school at north vermilion uh were you really indoctrinated in, into tigerdom at a young age uh, I went to my first LSU football game in 1987. At that point, I was not really into sports, didn't really know much about it. And it was kind of around me. I hear dad talking about LSU football and sometimes I'm yelling at the TV or whatever. And it was LSU, Florida, 1987. Uh, Emmett Smith was a freshman running back for the uh, uh, for Florida. Tommy, H So these are my first collection of heroes. Tommy Hodson, Harvey Williams, Wendell Davis. Uh, you know, those guys on that LSU team. Nacho Albergamo, who's now my doctor, was the center, the All-American. They put him up wow. every week, the the uh, academic All-American, you know, Nacho Albergamo, 4.0 student in med, you know. Uh, and, and, and when I walked into that stadium, I'd never seen anything like that. I'd never seen, I could not believe the amount of people, you know, it just your eyes and your brain couldn't comprehend what you were seeing. It was 80,000 back then. And uh, that was it. The hook was in the mouth by Monday. I knew all the players. I knew what stats were. And uh, and I was hooked. And I and I used to think I was going to be like Jim Hawthorne. I wanted to be a play-by-play -play guy. I used to sit in front of the TV with a tape recorder and and I'd do play-by-play. -play. My friends would think that was cool for about five minutes. And they'd say, shut up. We've heard enough. You know? So um, and when we used to play Tecmo Bowl all night. And they'd say, shut yes. do play-by-play -play the Tecmo Bowl. And I'd do it. You know, so um, it wasn't until college. And you know, I'm like halfway through college. It's like, what am I going to do? And so uh, I started interning at TV 10 in Lafayette, KLFY, and started learning. I'm like, well, I guess this is, this is what I'm going to do. And so I learned how to use a camera and learned how to edit, uh, learned how to work on deadline and learned all the things that you had no idea what TV was. So, um, Lon, it's like anything else. You see it from afar and you think you get an idea. I'm just going to go on TV, talk for a few minutes. And then between shows, I'm going to drink some beers with the buddies at the bar. Then I'm going to go back do the 10. You know, you really bust your ass all day for three minutes four minutes and uh you know and, and anchoring is almost the easy part it's all the other stuff you're doing 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 during the day man I, i've seen you work firsthand first person jock <laughs> i was i was shocked that you were the one doing the filming at that time i don't know if that's changed but like you were do you were setting up the shots you were doing so much of the legwork it was incredible to see that like really what you see the viewers i know there's a great team at wafb jock and I know yeah. you're you're very humble and you're always going to put them first. But like, really, I've seen you work in person and um, you were a beast out there in spring practices. Well, Lon, uh, and compliment you as well. I mean, I see the content you're cranking out every day. I'm like, when this guy took the, how do you have the time to write this? You know, you, bang, another article from Lon, bang, another article from Lon. So uh, I, I commend you certainly on, on that. But, you know, the truth is when I first start, yeah. 
Oh, absolutely. Well, when I first started the job, I sucked. Okay. When I when I went from Alexandria to here, uh, I was in way over my skis. The the speed of the game, so to speak, was so much greater than I expected. And the fans here don't don't tolerate a guy who doesn't do his job well. And in the beginning, um, you know, I was all about, you know, I'm going to look good. But my, my news director was like, you're like a cake that's not cooked on the inside. You may think you look good, but, you know, when people are going to start eating, you're not cooked. You know, you're sloppy. And really, you don't realize how many mistakes you can make where you've got to be the one that puts the score in. You've got to be the one that, you know, does all that stuff. And I just made a ton of mistakes. I was I, I, I was way too – I'd shout. I'd still shout. But I was like, you know, just talk to people. Stop shouting at people, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, the stuff that you talk about, you know, Darren DeQuano, our videographer, I mean, he 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 he's a bigger role or much bigger in a role than these, these things back here, uh, you know, more than I am. I mean, I, I truly did not hit my stride, even if you want to call this, until I got into my 40s in this business, where I really was truly comfortable – and, you know, just kind of trying to be myself and, and had job security. And so, um, you know, these these awards that we get, they're great. But then you say, I did the same thing last year that I did this year. Why why did I win this year and not last? So it's just, you know, that kind of stuff all evens out, like baseball, you know. Um, so thank you. I, I You know, I just have a dream job. You know, if I um, – I never, like, wake up saying, oh, i got to go to work today. You know, oh, this sucks. You know, and I tell, I tell the interns that in, in LSU classes. You don't want to go to uh, uh, your job looking at your watch. I've been here two hours. I got another six hours to go. Uh, when do I get to leave? You know, and uh, and sometimes you won't be paid the greatest. I mean, I think that's well known. But uh, if you chase money, then you may be unhappy too. So that's what I always try to, you know, the message I tell people. One hundred percent agreed. There, I've I've seen both sides of that in my own family. Uh, you know, but you know, Jacques, what, you know, saying what you just said, would you change anything about? how your career has developed, like the trajectory of your career? Would you change anything? Uh, you know, it, it's like anybody else in a public forum uh, steps on stage. I mean, there's probably some stories I would have handled differently over the years, uh, you know, and not, you know, there was a press conference with Les Miles after 2010 Tennessee game where they had that debacle at the end, the clock debacle and all that. And uh, honestly, I, I had just – emotionally gotten tired of him being so lucky. I hate to say it that way, but it was almost like, you know, you, the, uh, the process doesn't match up with the results you won, but you had no business winning, you know? And so at that press conference, I, I think somebody had, had like egg me on, like give him hell shock. And so uh, that was, a <laughs> that was a mistake. So I went to the press conference that day and I got handed the mic and I really didn't even like, I, I didn't even plan it or whatever. And I was nervous as hell, man. My heart is pounding. And I'm just like, I'm just like, uh, coach, I don't know how to say this, but there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between you and the fan base. Uh, you were lucky to win that game. It was blind luck, but you act ecstatic and blah, blah, blah. And, and I just went on and it went in the paper. I think it was, they, they described it as a 30 second diatribe that never morphed into a question. And so, uh, so yeah, that was, that was one. And, and a lot of people at the time, they uh, they sent me emails. Thank you so much. I appreciate you doing that. But it was not the right thing to do. A year later, LSU starts 13-0, and obviously makes a national championship game. Before the 2019 team looked like the greatest team in LSU history, honestly, before they lost to Alabama. And um, and then somebody came up to me the next year and said, you're that guy that disrespected our coach. You know, So they went <laughs> retro retroactive on me. You know, So anyway, that's one thing I would handle differently, I think. <laughs> I mean – Jacques, it's still, it, it, it's something that even though you may have mis, look, you know, viewed it as a misstep, I mean, it still worked out in a way. I mean, yeah. At a, at a young age, though, like really young age for you, when you're first, you know, wanting to do this, you're, you know, first getting into the, into this job, what really helped you solidify your goals, you know, like for the future at a young age? I think, Lon, that I was never uh, the most organized. Uh, I was never, um, uh, you know, I, I got through college with a 2.3 GPA or something like that, 2.4. You know, I was never, I, I oftentimes li didn't live up to my potential. And, you know, the people said, my parents, you were way too smart to be making these kind of grades, you know. But I think the one thing I always had uh, was enthusiasm. And the fact that I love this stuff so much that 
if I did forget the battery back at the station, which should have should have sunk me, I need enthusiasm to haul ass back and go get it, or you know, run over here or run over there to make up for those mistakes. And I just think I think my enthusiasm and my love for covering LSU athletics and and um, the Saints and all the things I get to cover here uh, carried me through uh, a lot of my shortcomings, so to speak, and allowed me to to stick around because there were definitely times in the beginning where uh, it was like, is he going to last six months? at this station and uh wow and, and, and thank goodness i you know thank goodness that they stuck by me and uh and it, and it all worked out because i got hired at 24 and i was probably uh, the had the maturity of a 14 year old at the time and um just temper uh you know now i'm getting older now i don't i don't, I don't, I don't get i don't get all fired up <laughs> and and mad like i used to but i had a temper and i used to blow up and throw chairs and stuff but uh you that's know, that, awesome. I can't. I mean, that just seems so so not you. That's so cool. That's that's weird to hear. Yeah. Well, they it, it was it wasn't cool for. I, I got I got a warning at some point. Like, okay, you got to chill out, or you know, you're not going to stick around here. So, yeah. um, that's a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But you know, when when I started, um, I was I had a long way to go. <laughs> so, I mean, was that the most difficult time period in your development? Yeah, I, you know, and Lon, I'm lucky too that Twitter wasn't around and Facebook wasn't really, you know, that there there was the internet, but and you could go to a message board and and see people, you know, cut you to pieces or listen to the local radio. Uh, I remember one time I, I I listened to the local radio. It was like uh, I was driving to something, and one of the local sports talk shows started talking about me and the new guy on Channel Nine. How many times they putting on the putting him on the air? Like four or five times a week. Oh my God, he's so terrible. I mean, I literally was listening on the radios. They were like, you know, nailing me to the cross. <laughs> and so, and, uh, but you know what? There is something to be said about that because that, that really, um, uh, anger and that kind of thing can motivate you in a strange way. I mean, it, it really kind of, I'm going to show these people, you know, and I'm going to do it. And so, um, that, that, that did motivate. But yeah, it was tough in the beginning. I mean, uh, WAFB, when I got there, I mean, the local news crew, there was like the Beatles of local TV. You had George Sells and Donna Britt doing the news. They were like the most popular duo in the country, like like uh, like for a small market station. Uh, Steve Schneider doing Sports Forever. Mike Graham, the weather guy. Uh, the great Paul Gates, our investigative reporter. I mean, I, I literally couldn't believe I was sitting on the set with these people in the beginning. And I was so immature and so cocky and all that. But, um, you know, I just had to uh, I just had to weather the storm. I just had to, and the coaches lawn too that I dealt with. I mean, I had Nick Saban as the head football coach. Here I am, this little dweeb trying to, ah, coach, uh, eh, you know, cool. trying to ask questions. And he's, you know, tearing me up. John Brady at the time was the basketball coach. He was not warm and fuzzy either. And then I had Skip Bertman, who, who was kind of, that was just like intimidating. You know, I've been watching this guy on TV for years, the legend, and now I'm trying to ask him questions. So it was, uh, it was something. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a total kind of golden age of LSU sports right there that you went through the gauntlet uh, during. That's kind of, that's yeah. kind of interesting because I, I just see a lot of parallels with the, uh, you know, I, I feel like there's times I'm making a, 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 just a bunch of mistakes. There's times I feel like I entered a little too cocky. There's times, um, you know, lots of things where a lot of parallels with, with what you're saying, but still, you know, uh, it's just, it's just crazy because, you know, just seeing how you've, I mean, just hearing all these things, you're saying you're, you're throwing chairs, you're, you're copying <laughs> all this, like no one views you like that. So it's just, it's just very funny to, to hear this from you, but. Yeah. Well, yeah. I had to learn too, that, uh, when my face gets angry, nobody likes, nobody, nobody looks good when they're mad. You know, I mean, everyone looks better when they smile and when they're friendly and, and it, it is, it is tempting sometimes, you know, in today's, uh, look, I've excelled at Twitter and stuff, but if you notice, it's more and more. I, I just share stuff now. Here's the story I did. Here's a sound bite. I don't. I'm not interested in getting into what I call food fights on Twitter. Nobody cares. You know, no, uh, I, people like Do you see. I put him in his place yesterday. I put her in her place. You know, people don't care about that, and that's not going to gain you followers. That's not going to help you win awards if you want to do stuff like that. Um, so that that that's the temptation these days is just let that be because it's going to go on all day long. The first time you respond and tell that guy, you know, shut the hell up, 
he's going to respond. Then you respond. And then you're answering notifications. Your, your, your phone's vibrating in your pocket all day. So, um, yeah. so yeah, it, that, that's the temptation. I mean, if you look, even the greatest in this business, the Kirk Herb streets of the world and stuff, the second they tweet, the first two or three responses are somebody trying to earn some clout by, I'm going to put Kirk Herbstreet in his place. You know, I'm going to say yep. this to him, whatever. And so that's the, that, that's the bad side. The good side, Lon, is you can share things in real time. I can, the second LSU gets off the bus at the Swamp in Gainesville, I can shoot it on my phone, tweet it out, and share that. That's the beauty of technology. Um, yeah. It's the other stuff that's not good. I 100% agree with you. It's something that I definitely have been working on myself. Like it's, it is such a, a, a downward, downward spiral once you get into it, but it's, it's uh you, you know, I want to show that person. I want to troll that person hardcore publicly. And, you know, I, it's, it's something that I've definitely just tried to completely ignore, just bury myself in the work. And, you know, that's the thing is, you know, when I first got to know you, Jacques, before I even met you, I mean, I've only met you at the at the spring practices this last March, which was awesome, by the way. But um, this whole thing that I'm doing started back in mid-2018, became a website in, in August 2019, came LSU Odyssey by name in October 2019. But then, like, the sports media stuff, the whole world just cut off for us, Jacques, in, in 2020. And... At that time, at the time, I knew it was kind of like a big moment, one I'd never get back, like an opportunity to have like undivided attention of the entire fan base, really. And during that time, I began to find out a lot more about who you were, Jacques, because because just day after day after day, uh, we were entertaining the troops, so to speak. That's when I realized how, how just tireless and relentless you are with you know these these interviews, your stories, why you're so good at what you do, and how much dedication effort and, and just how much I would need to generate to stay anywhere close. And, it, you know, it was kind of therapeutic uh, for, for myself at the time to kind of keep focusing, burying myself in that work during that uh, political crazy 2020. I, what do you remember about that time and the impact it, it may have had or, or didn't have on your craft? Well, it was, uh, it was very weird. I mean, I remember driving to, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, I was going up to cover the SEC basketball tournament. And uh, I think I stopped in Tuscaloosa to eat at a, eat at a uh, steak restaurant. And then I was watching the NBA that said something about COVID or some, some basketball player at NBA. And, you know, so what is that? So uh, I drove to, I drove one day all the way up to Nashville I wake up in the morning and I'm hearing that they're going to close the arena to fans. There's going to be no fans at the SEC tournament. I start to see these Kentucky fans check out of their hotel. A little while later, I hear that the entire tournament is going to be – the SEC tournament is going to be canceled. And then by the afternoon, they had canceled the NCAA tournament, men's and women. And then they had, they had canceled the College World Series, men's baseball and softball. And that was just shocking. Like – it's March. You're canceling something in late June. What? What is this? And so, um, yeah, just it, it, it's and so sad, too. I mean, look, people died, but so sad. Like the next weekend, I was out covering like Bruley Baseball High School is doing their senior day, like in the middle of March. This is the last game these guys are going to play because their season has been wiped out. There's going to be no more baseball because of COVID. Um, top 28 games being played in empty gyms. Uh, it was, it was very, you know, not, um, you know, I'd gone through nine 11 and Katrina. Those were things that were life changing. And, but this was, uh, this was affected the whole world. I mean, it was, uh, it was much different. And so, um, uh, they used to, Michael Bonnet and those guys would joke at me that, that I had a tent and I was sleeping on the levee every night to grab interviews, <laughs> but Truly, I, 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 every day I drive to work and I drive down the levee by LSU. I love the levee by LSU. If you ever go jogging, if you're a jogger, it's a beautiful place. You got the Mississippi River, you got Tiger Stadium. It's really nice in the Port spring. Allen, right? Yeah, yeah. You see Port Allen and all that. I mean, it's really, uh, you know, uh, free, you know, something you can do for free that's great. Go jog on the levee by LSU in the spring. But anyway, I drive to work every day and I, and I'd see these big guys on the levee. I'm like, well, that's Lloyd Cushenberry over there running with, um, you know, uh, CD Charles and, uh, uh, whoever else, you know? And so I literally would like park my car and walk over because they knew me. I interviewed him and say, Hey guys, what's going on? Can I shoot some video? You guys like training? Yeah, that's cool. Whatever. 
So I'd, I'd shoot video of Rashard Lawrence run up and down the levee, and then I'd interview him afterwards. And and we were fresh off the greatest season of all time in LSU football, and so people couldn't get enough of that. Yeah, It's funny how that works, Lon, in 2011, after LSU got blanked by Alabama. Shut up about that game. Don't talk about that game. You know, it's like it's like two days after. What do you mean? I can't. T- so, yeah. But in this case, we can keep talking about it forever. But so, yeah, I would I would do that kind of stuff. And then Zoom, like you and I right now, this was not like in the past. The When I do, it was either like I talk to somebody in person or I record them on the phone. There was none of this. I, I never even crossed my mind that I could record somebody like you right now talking to you on a computer. And so that all started. And uh, so, like, I did some chats with Will Muschamp and some other people that, you know, and and, uh, and I just kind of, we've been working on a Cecil Collins thing for like two years now that eventually is going to see the light of day, hopefully in 2023. But we, we've we been working on a Cecil Collins project for like, so it started with Booger McFarland. Like, I was doing a chat with Booger. And yeah. just casually, I'm talking about just throwing stuff out. And I just said, uh, Cecil Collins, how good was he? And he was like, the greatest running back I've ever seen. Whoa, 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 hang on a second. Greatest running back you've ever seen. You played in the NFL how long? You know, 13 years. Ago. Best you've ever seen. Best I've ever seen. And then I had other people tell me the same. Kevin Falk, uh, Todd McClure, you know, guys that's been – So Cecil Collins played three and a half games in his LSU career. And um, and so we have been we interviewed him. We've interviewed a lot of different people. And we've got all this stuff, you know, and we're going to do a documentary on it. It, it sometime so uh darren and i've been working on it and so it, it'll be hopefully like we had planned like i was going to try to get it out this year because it was the 25 year anniversary of him against auburn in tiger stadium but next year auburn comes to tiger stadium so i'm thinking maybe by then we can throw it all together because that was the summer of like uh the michael jordan thing uh the documentary with him and stuff and, and so like, why don't we try to do a local version of something like that so Anyway, uh, absolutely, because I mean, Cecil Collins, I don't even think he's ever been really officially interviewed, has he? Because of what what transpired with his career, obviously, with the. Yeah, the, uh, the assault. And I hope I didn't talk too much there because I haven't really like put it out there. So that's an exclu- I mean, some people in the media know we've been working on this stuff, but um, he's been out of prison for, I think, eight or nine years now. And he's yeah. incredible story about, you know, how he meets his his wife meets him in prison like she visits him for years and uh and they live now in houston and they have a they have a little boy and all that but uh but yeah it's a, he he is what was the one they did on marcus dupree or something he, he's definitely um it's amazing if you'd say his name people know who you're talking about he only played a handful of games at lsu you know 25 years ago but um you know truly one of the biggest what if probably the biggest what if story in lsu history i think uh, he and Paralu. Uh, yeah, so. that was the name. That was the name I was about to throw out because I mean, there's there's a lot of what ifs in LSU history. I mean, there's a lot of just just even recently, but Paralu, Cecil Collins. I mean, massive, massive. Paralu, like I've I've done a couple sit downs with Paralu, and it's almost like you want to grab him. What 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 are you doing, man? It's like you were handed the keys to the to the Ferrari. You were going to be the quarterback of the defending national champion. You got Demetrius Bird and Brandon LaFell and uh, Richard Dixon and all these guys, and you got Charles Scott in the backfield. It's like, you guys could have been great, man. Why couldn't you go to class? Why couldn't you? Oh, man, you know, yeah. just, just uh, you know, imma- young and immature, you know. And so, but, uh, you know, Ryan, uh, Ryan's been cool. We've sat down with him a couple times and done long interviews with him, and it's just, you know, just unfortunate. Seeing you do that, the the, the Paralu interview just like blew my mind. I was like, "Oh my god, Jock is tracking down Paralu!" Like this dude is <laughs> like Chevy Chase and Fletch. Like th- like he's getting to everybody. Like no one is beyond reach. I mean, not Burrow, Burrow, Joe. Hey, c- come talk to me. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you you've talked to Burrow. You've talked not, to Burrow a bunch of well, not one on one when he was oh. here in nineteen. Yeah, but oh yeah, so, for like a Jock talk. Right, like a one-on-one. Like he's not big on media. Like he'll do it, but yeah. he is not a uh, glory hound in that regard. You know, he he's not big on that. Jamar Chase too. Jamar was never like a talker. His dad's a big talker, but <laughs> yeah, Jimmy. Jimmy. But uh, yeah, Jamar was not a big talker. But uh, yeah, that that's the one. If I could do a sit down with a one-on-one with Joe Burrow and a one-on-one with Drew Brees and a one-on-one with Sammy Hagar, I, I that's it. I, I'm I'm out. <laughs> 
Sammy, hey, guys. We, we just got to do it again every time you bring it up. Sammy, hey, guys. <laughs> we got to do it. I mean, you just brought it up, though. I mean, that's, that's really what we got to talk to you about, Jacques, because this season at LSU, I mean, Jacques, we, if I were, when, when you walked in, met me for the first time in spring practices, you were so awesome. You just walked straight up, shook my hand. We're like, welcome. You know, you're just so welcoming. It was awesome. But if I were to right then just say, hey, Jacques, <laughs> by the way, on November 22nd, November 23rd, 2022, LSU will be nine and two. We'll be in the SEC title game and number five in the college football playoff rankings with a win and you're in scenario against Georgia in the SEC title game. What, I mean, what would your reaction be? Uh, I'd be saying, Lon, you got the purple and gold glasses on. Uh, you've been drinking the purple and gold Kool-Aid. No, I, I, I mean, it, it really was kind of a, uh, it felt like the land of misfit toys. It's like, uh, okay, here's a guy from East Tennessee state. Here's a guy from Florida international. Here's a, couple of guys from Arkansas. Here's a guy, a couple of guys, raging Cajuns. We're just trying to patch this thing together and, wow. you know, eat a, you know, what sandwich in our first year. I mean, I've seen this so many times over the years with different coaches with that first year, whether it's Will Wade coming in off of Johnny Jones, Paul Maneri coming in after smoke Lavelle, um, you know, a lot of different cases where the first year is like, it's really rough. It's pulling teeth. It's inheriting guys that the coach didn't recruit. And oh, I'm stuck with this kid, you know, that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, the first game of the year, and Jaden Daniels, honestly, I'm like, this guy's played a lot. He's average, maybe above average. And they're going to go six and six or seven and five with him. And he'll be the bridge to Walker Howard or Garrett Nussmeyer or whatever. Jaden Daniels is the MVP of the team. And it's not even close. It's like without him, LSU is not where they are today. And, uh, you know, early in the year, he had struggles, this and that. But, you know, his ability to run, the touchdowns he scored, the touchdowns he's thrown, the two-point conversion against Alabama, without question, in my opinion, the MVP of the team. So those are the kind of stories that have happened this year. If you would have told me two years ago, Josh Williams is going to be counted on to beat Alabama, get out of here. No way. You know, jo little Josh Williams, no way. And uh, another great story, you know, of a guy just does everything he's told. I'm going to block, I'm going to catch, I'm going to run, I'm going to be a 3.5 student, I'm going to graduate in business. I mean, come on. Uh, so it's those kind of great stories that uh, that I've really enjoyed telling this year. And, yeah, it's incredible uh, that they are in this spot. And Jimbo Fisher's in his fifth year, and he's having his worst year ever, and Brian Kelly's in his first and going to the going to Atlanta. I mean, it's – how about that? <laughs> it's it's just beautiful. I mean, this is this is what you – this is why I'm an LSU fan. You know, very young, out here on the West. You know, everybody is just kind of, you know, picking their team. You know, in a way. You know, and most people really weren't really into college football. Maybe more into the NFL. But man, just the swagger, the way that LSU were able to win games. This is when I was. This is the late '90s. I'm way young, but my older brothers are just getting me into football like crazy. And man, CBS. Watching, watching Kevin Falk do what he did, you know, watching all these guys do what they did from LSU, the swagger, the way that we pull things out, the way that we've kind of just been able to flip this switch out of nowhere. And I understand that we've been a struggling program most seasons in the, in the last uh, 20 years, but then you've also got you know, three national championships, four trips to the national title game. And here we go on the cusp of a, a you know, possibly a, a fifth trip to the, to the title game. I mean, you, you've witnessed every game up close and personal, Jacques, this season. And getting getting closer to the program than anyone else, what is this team's identity and how have they been able to do this? Uh, I think their identity is – I really think that the record may be greater than the individual parts, and that's no knock on the team. But, I mean, there's plenty of talent, but, it you know, it's not – I mean, I don't know how many guys are going to get drafted this year or whatever. I have to sit and look at it. But, you know, they've gone running back by committee. Uh, there's no Leonard Fournette. There's no Bell Cow that we're going to, you know, give the ball to 20, 25 times. Um, the offensive line is kind of, was kind of, you know, patched together. We're going to play two true freshmen on the offensive line. Are you crazy? We're going to get the quarterback killed. But Will Campbell and Emory Jones have held their own. 
I love that soundbite by Brian Kelly the other day when Campbell missed the block against someone and, and, and Kelly's like, he explains it in a way that it is not going to happen again for the rest of his life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's so, like, he was blown away. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and guys like BJ Ojolari who stuck around and has been tremendous this year. And, um, and your your you know a canes. I mean, that's why you don't quit a team, right? I mean, that's why even if you're like your fourth in the rotation, uh, you know, you're gonna score three touchdowns against UAB, and now you're gonna get a chance this weekend probably to be the bell cow against uh Texas AM. I mean, Josh Williams hopefully comes back, but he's got a dinged up knee, and John Emery coughed the ball up twice last week. So Noah Kane and looks like gonna be the guy that they're gonna have to count on this week. So I just think the identity is is that you know, I was at the Texas Bowl last year at a pretty morbid event <laughs> an empty stadium getting boat raced by Kansas state with John Trey Kirkland playing quarterback and like, what, what is going on here? And to now, you know, being in a situation that they're in and it starts with the coach. I mean, it's, it's the head coach. It's the people that he hired. He was very meticulous in hiring his staff. Matt house is, you know, going to is a finalist for assistant coach of the year. Then Brock was kind of beat up early, but I think he's done his, his job. And uh, here they are. So uh, it, it's just, you know, you're, you're the most fun you have is when it's unexpected, like 2008 when LSU baseball won 23 games in a row and they were like five, nine and one in the SEC. And all of a sudden they just go on this tear. And that was fantastic. Or 2006 when I got a chance to cover the final four team with Glenn yeah. Big Baby Davis and Tyrus Thomas and Garrett Temple and Tasman Mitchell and all these local guys that beat Duke, the number one seed in the NCAA tournament in Atlanta, Georgia in front of 30,000 fans. Uh, you know, that was, whoa, they did that. Yeah, I was surprised, you know, and so this team is, uh, you know, got, got a taste of that. This was not supposed to happen, especially after the first game. It was like Florida State ain't no good. LSU ain't no good. Those two teams are going to go six and six and, uh, and look where we are now. So it's true. I mean, no one was giving LSU any, any real chance. I mean, when, when we put out our schedule predictions for the season, I think about a week or two before the season, we said nine and three would be the record. And we, we picked that because we felt like that the SEC was a lot weaker than people were thinking. We thought that it wasn't going to be just Georgia and Alabama out in front. We thought it was going to be a lot more interesting than that. And there'd be kind of some in-conference cannibalism. And I just saw a coaching staff that could elevate this roster. I got so much crap for that nine and three pick. Like you're a sunshine. Pepper. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is why I'm picking that. And I feel like, you know, maybe Jaden Daniels could, can really pull this off. And I thought Jaden Daniels would be a far better. You know, I thought the passing game would have a way bigger impact and way bigger effect for us to win those nine games. If you were to tell me LSU would have, you know, booty has one touchdown through, through 12 games or, or 11 games. Right. Uh, Neighbors has one touchdown through 11 games. Besh has one touchdown through 11 games. I would yeah. literally laugh you off the stage. Just like, no way, no way. I mean, if you were to tell me that, then I'm probably picking seven wins for LSU as well. So like, you know, this, it, the, the way that this has happened is so brilliant. It's so surprising. It's so, it's just one of those happy accidents. But Jacques, it's no accident with the, the team's heart. Is this one of the most like resilient LSU teams you've been around? Yeah. And, you know, there's an old saying, the harder you work, the luckier you, you get. And I'm not going to say, I don't want to use the word lucky because that, that discredits them. But you know, early on in the season, they got a few breaks. A couple of those games, like the Mississippi State game, they're they're in control of that game, and they fumble. The state fumbles a punt at their own ten yard line, and that that just flipped the game. And then LSU took off with it. the The Auburn game, I'm there. I'm like, I'm like, the roof is about to cave in here. LSU is about to get blown out. Like Jordan Hare Stadium was rocking, and Auburn's about to make it twenty one to nothing. And LSU held them to a field goal to make it 17 nothing, and kind of wiped the blood off their nose and got back in the game. And then Auburn, you know, threw a halfback pass with Corey Moore at the, at the 10-yard line or whatever. So, you know, Brian Harson kind of helped LSU to an extent there too. But, uh, you know, the Florida game, I think, is when you look on and you say, okay, in that case, finally this offense, uh, you know, got going. And I think there was a third down, third long early in the game where uh, Daniels finally trusted himself and just let the thing rip, and he hit booty. Uh, deep down the field for for a play. And then there was the play to Jure Jenkins. I, I should have mentioned Jure Jenkins by now. I just love doing that story on him from the small town of uh, Gina, Louisiana, 4,000 people that have, you know, 4,000 number 10 jerseys. <laughs> that was damn good. That was a damn 
good story. Everybody, well, check that out on wafb.com. Seriously, that was probably my favorite of the season so far is the one on Dre because I mean this this dude is made no one really talks about him. Everyone's talking about the big names first. Six touchdowns, I think it is, or five touchdowns in key, key moments. We're talking with z- triple zeros on the clock against Florida State. He's the one making the play. We're talking the touchdown when LSU were down 13 to nothing against Mississippi State, about to go into halftime. And we get that touchdown and make it 13 to seven. Totally, you know, kind of calms things for us as well. You know, he's constantly been making these plays. What did you really like? What did you feel that you learned the most that was like very surprising about Jure when you were doing that story? Well, um, before the Alabama game in 2020, one of the most depressing days on LSU's campus ever, uh, I had to do come up with some sort of material for the six o'clock show. Yeah. And LSU's playing Alabama. It's like, it was like December because of the, the schedule got pushed back. Like there's Christmas trees up. LSU's playing Alabama. There's there's nobody on campus. I mean, we drove straight to the stadium. It's this nasty overcast day. And uh, I see this guy with a number 10 jersey. And I'm like, well, that's got to be related to like a fan. You know, it's got to be Jure's dad or something. So I go talk to Mr. Jure's dad. And I did a quick interview with him. And, you know, Jure had kind of surprised that year. Like going into 2020, we were talking about uh, – Oh, number 17 from the national championship team, wide receiver. Oh, Racy. Racy McMath. There you go. So, Racy and Terrence Tolliver, and uh, not Terrence Tolliver, uh, Terrence Marshall, excuse me. He was going to be like, these are the guys. And then, you know, Terrence opted out, and Racy was kind of hurt. And and Jure kind of was like stepped up and was like, I, I think he caught the first bomb from Miles Brennan in that Mississippi State game and yes. caught the game winner at Arkansas. And so I interviewed his dad anyway. I got his phone number and I said, you know, I'm from a small town like you are, much smaller than even Gina, but I want to I want to come up there one day and do a story. And it took a while and back and forth. And finally it was like, okay, I'm coming up. And so I drove three hours, it was a three hour drive from Baton Rouge to Gina. I feel like I interviewed everybody in the town. They brought everybody out, the mayor. The, so it was awesome. Interviewed them all, drove the three hours back. And then I really edited that thing for a week or so. I mean, there was just so much stuff in there. Okay, change that shot or put that sound bad in. So anyway, uh, I think the thing that I learned was the teacher that said that um, her son had died tragically and that uh, on his birthday, Jure, like she woke up to a text message from Jure thinking about you today, love you, that. That was one of the stories that was told that I was like, wow, that's, a, you know, that's right here stuff. So, uh, so I enjoyed that and just hearing all the different stories from the people in the town. That that's the thing about this team. I mean, I've gotten to know a lot of these young men and over the last two years, three years, some of them, but then, you know, some of these transfers just the last year, you know, guys like Makai Wingo, but like these, there's a, there's a heart and soul kind of, there's a character to this team that is really unique. Um, they, they're really active, involved in the community. Like I, I've seen them really proud to be Louisiana. And then, you know, guys who are, you know, from out of state, coming in who are proud to adopt being Louisiana, you know, representing Louisiana. What, what do you sense about that from this team and what Brian Kelly is like bringing to the program as someone from, you know, from an outside state, as far North as you could be, um, you know, what, what, what type of Louisiana identity, I guess I'm trying to say, is he bringing to LSU? Well, um, you know, I talked to Mason Taylor who caught the two pointer against, um, you know, uh, against Alabama to win the game there. And he he didn't grow up on all this LSU, Alabama stuff and Nick Saban stuff and whatever. I mean, if it had been me, I didn't, oh, my God, they're going to throw me a two-point conversion. Like some of these these guys that didn't grow up on it, so maybe they don't know any better. But uh, I think Brian Kelly's um, – this graduate champions, like when he first started saying it, it was like, oh, what – Oh, come on. Okay. Uh, you know, you want guys to go to class. Okay. Yeah. But you're here to win football games. There's not going to be anybody on Nicholson drive after LSU loses 31 to 10. and said, well, uh, it's okay. The players are graduating. So that's cool. You know, no one, <laughs> no one's going to say that, but I thought he made a great point. He said, if I can't trust you to class, then you're going to jump off sides or if I can't, you know, and, and so it all, you know, kind of yeah. ties in together. And, um, 
And and I, at first, I was like, why is he banging this academic thing so much? You know, and obviously, you want people to go to class and get their degrees. That's cool. But you come to LSU mostly, and and that maybe is something that was kind of going on that needed to be stopped. I mean, everyone's like, oh, I'm in three years and I'm out, bro. I mean, I'm come, I'm I'm in and I'm out. You're lucky to have me, and I'm going to the to the NFL. And I think maybe now, um, you know, that impresses parents when they hear that there's another avenue. If if heaven forbid somebody gets hurt, that I can do this instead. So I think that's you know that's something that's new um, with him. Um, I think he 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 he's kind of like this every day. Jay Johnson is like that too. I mean, there's they're not. He gets emotional. Brian Kelly is coaching. You see him yelling, shouting, all that stuff. Oh yeah. But uh, you know, you can get all hyped up on caffeine, lawn, bounce around, and think you're doing something. You haven't done anything. So he has a plan every day, I think. I just think he's got a meticulous process. He says, I've had the same system since he's been at, what, Grand Valley State or whatever. And uh, he's implemented everywhere he's been. And and in his first year at LSU, he beat Nick Saban because he had talent, you know, to compete. When he was in the 2012 National Championship game against an Alabama team that LSU let off the hook in Tiger Stadium, he got trounced 42 to 14. So that's why he came here. Absolutely. And, you know, it's almost a year that he's been here. Almost a year. I think it's like three or four days, and it'll be that full 60, 365. I mean, Jacques, you're probably the only LSU media man or woman to interview Brian Kelly outside of Warsham and Emily Dixon. And you seem to be, well, of course, uh, I think it's that uh, former player from Notre Dame and some ESPN people, of course, but you seem to be really impressed uh, when I first was attending those uh, spring press conferences, I remember us all waiting uh, outside uh, LSU football ops, and you and Scarborough were saying how you know he's giving us more access than we've ever had before. Um, how I think it was Brody Miller who said, like, I haven't seen the Lawton room since since 2019. <laughs> uh, what what like what what about Brian Kelly has left you a little like WTF? Like, whoa. Like really stunned. I was really surprised um, that he gave us so much in the fall. Like when he gave us so much in the spring, I'm like, well, when when August rolls around, we're not going to get a whole lot because he yeah. let us watch. Like, I mean, over the years, LSU's basically almost copied and pasted from Donardo to Saban, Saban to Miles, Miles to Ogeron. It was always, okay, you guys come in for 10, 15 minutes. We're going to watch you. You're going to watch the guy stretch. There's going to be the toss sweeps to the running back with against air. There's going to be the throwing to the wide receivers against air, and then that's it, and you get out. And so in this case, like in the spring, I'm like, we get to stay the whole, the whole practice? We get to stay the whole time? And not only that, but then stay for scrimmages, like, I, one day we were there and I, I, I told somebody, I said, I've got more good B-roll in the last five minutes than I got like in the last 10 years combined. Like I actually got like wide receivers running around, going up against a DB and jumping up and either making the catch or getting knocked away. I mean, we got so much great video. So that really surprised me that he let us see as much as we were able to see. Um, and then that he continued that in, in the fall. And the one difference now is it used to be during in the season we would go out to LSU on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and shoot some B-roll practice. We don't do that anymore. Practice are closed, but we don't need it because we got the B-roll from the games. That's what we're showing now, anyway. So, uh, so anyway, that that that's what had surprised me, um, you know, the most is that the, he gave us so much media access. And and really, you know, I covered those two bowl games he played against LSU, the uh, Music City Bowl in fourteen, and then the Citrus Bowl in seventeen. And I, both those press conferences, I walked away. I told Darren, "It's like I ain't gonna use any of this." I mean, he, the guy didn't say anything. He's, you know, he's he's gruff. He's just kind of abrasive. And and uh, but I told somebody today. I, I think I was on Jordy Collada's show. I said uh, I, he hadn't snapped at the media one time since he's been here. Like any press conference, he hadn't he hadn't yelled at anybody or he answers your questions. Uh, I think in a in, a, in an informative way, he tells you stuff. He doesn't just give you the canned answers. Nope. So, uh, I mean, he's been great. It's uh, it kind of similar to Kim Mulkey. Like, when Kim Mulkey came here, I was like, oh, they're going to win, and they're going to win big. But, oh, she's a handful. 
Oh, she's going to wear you out. Oh, she's going to watch your sports cast. And if, if she's, if you're not, don't put her where she feels like she's going to shout. None of that. I mean, she's nice as can be and very approachable and great. So uh, maybe somebody else, you lawn when they come here. <laughs> well, I think they also can see from ahead of time, like, Hey, I got to grow some thick skin here. Like this is, if you know, you, you're going to be criticized. You're going to run into those walls. I mean, they even criticize, as you said before, the, the coverage of the team, the media members, like we're, we're under intense scrutiny, um, <laughs> sometimes even more than the players themselves. Like it's ridiculous sometimes um, what I've seen out there from, from yeah. some of these. But Lana will say, top. I mean, he, he came from Notre Dame. And so, I mean, that's, that's a pretty intense, I mean, when you got the Chicago market covering you, those, those, they'll slice you and dice you. There's no doubt we're softies compared, <laughs> compared to them, but but yeah, uh, it, it's a uh, um, you know Les Miles when he first got here. I mean, it it kind of hit him like a tsunami to an extent. I mean, that first game where he had the little Britney Spears headset right here and stuff. Uh, you know, it, it was he had to adapt. There's no doubt. I remember that. Oh my God, uh, Jacques. Just a few more questions. I've taken up so much of your time. Uh, you know, Jacques, going into this game against Texas A and M, you're you're gonna, you're going to be driving into College Station. I'm kind of picturing this like Walking Dead post-apocalyptic vibe where you're driving in there in the <laughs> WAFB car and you're like, run, run for our lives. You know, like they're all zombies coming after you. The, the A&M fans, oh, you know, doing their, <laughs> their weird chants and their weird midnight uh, powwows. I know you've seen the footage. It's bizarre. What do you, what do you expect from this weekend? Do you, do you think there's any possible way, Ellis, you can bottle this? I interviewed a guy today from TexAgs.com, not Billy Lucci, but a guy named um, Olin Buchanan. And uh, I said, uh, I said, I think it's going to be one of two things, right? I mean, it's either they're going to throw everything they've got at this game. And Jimbo Fisher, this is going to be his talking point all offseason. Is that, well, we, we, finished the, we finished the season with a win over LSU, you know, and be the top 10 team, you know, and uh, – <laughs> And beat the SEC West champs. You know, that, that'll be his talking point. Like, the other losses, they will not – it's all going to be about we won our last two games and we beat LSU. But if they lose the game, then it's – we're 4-8 and eight and there's really nothing positive we can say about this whatsoever. And I, and, and I said, so what do you think? And he goes, well, Olin goes, I think Texas a and is going to throw everything at LSU. They just don't have anything to throw at, at you know, LSU. You know, they're just, they're just not that good of a football team. And you look at it, I think they're – I mean, they're at the bottom of the country in scoring. They average 21 points a game. That's like in the 120s out of 130. And they're in the bottom 120 of the country in stopping the run. They've been terrible against the run. Um, and so they don't do anything very well. They, they, they were, I mean, the weather was bad last week and it was cold. And, but really, they slept walked against UMass. And so um, I, my, I'm leaning towards the latter. I'm leaning towards that they're not going to put up much of a fight, but I could be wrong. But um, I, I just have this feeling as we've had enough of this season. Uh, we're, we're tapped out. This sucks. All these five stars that that came here, they're not really invested in this program. They're all hitting the transfer portal, and so uh, that's what it is. I don't like. I don't dislike Jimbo Fisher. I mean, uh, certainly he's had a great career. Uh, what he did at LSU was tremendous. And what he did at Florida State was tremendous. He got off that sinking ship at Florida State. He came over here to A and M, and I'm 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 a bit surprised that they haven't had more success. If he would have come here, I don't know what would have happened. If you had been the head coach at LSU, we'll never know. Would he've had great success here? Who knows? But uh, you know, we all sing Garth Brooks calling Baton Rouge as another song called "Unanswered Prayers," and and LSU flirted with him several times and. You know, if he would have come, you don't get 2019 and Brian Kelly's not your head coach. I know there's been some bumps and bruises along the way, but that's how it shakes out. And I'll take that any day over Jimbo Fisher, Jacques. <laughs> Jacques, you know, I really wanted to, to end the show on this note because this is something that I feel like defines you as a, as a human being. You know, J.D., I mean, it's not how just how you do the job. It's how you treat people. It's how you, it's how you represent the community that really makes – really made you stand out to me, you know, rediscovering LSU media and getting really deep into it as I was doing it myself, you know, starting out. Yeah. You know, you do a lot for this community as well. You know, 
Red Rock and Blue is your charitable organization that raises funds for veterans every single summer. You've got events like golfing, golfing trips with former LSU Tigers, celebrities hanging out there, the epic rock and roll show every July. You always supply. Tell the people a little about how that got started. Your maybe your never ending quest to get Sammy Hagar on that <laughs> stage, and you know where the people can donate and help out. Well, I'm. Um- part of it is I'm Peter Pan. I never grew, I never grew up and, uh, I had a love for music and I had a love for, um, sports and whatnot. And, um, MTV back in the day used to do something called rock and jock softball where they get all these celebrities together and play a softball game. And so I tried to do that. We did that for a number of years where I'd get celebrities to come play in a softball game. And, and then, uh, I, I enjoy putting concerts together and putting bands together, doing, you know, planning all that stuff. And, so I just kind of channel that and then it's like, okay, well, how can we use all this stuff? And uh, my one of my best friends, uh, Taylor Begno, uh, served our country in the Army in the early 90s, the first Gulf War, so to speak. And uh, he years ago said, you're on TV, you reach a lot of people, You the softball tournament we do every year, we ought to make this a uh, a charity of some kind, get back. And, and so we decided to give, 9-11 was still kind of fresh, and so we decided to... Uh, give to Louisiana charities. I was a local sportscaster. Let's keep it local. And so we started doing that. And and over the years, primarily we give to the Blue Star Moms of Louisiana, uh, Wounded War Heroes, not the Wounded Warrior Project. That's something totally different. Wounded War Heroes is local. And so they uh, sponsor fishing tournaments and uh, hunting, uh, hunting events for wounded military, you know, pay for the lodge, pay for the food, all that stuff, fancy hunting camps and whatnot. And so, Every year, the softball term is the big thing, and then we do a concert, and we've done some other spinoff events. But uh, we typically, I ju- we just gave a thirty-six thousand dollar check to Blue Star Moms of Louisiana. We're going to give a ten thousand dollar check to uh, Wounded War Heroes. So typically, we try to give in the neighborhood of forty to fifty thousand dollars in charity money every year, and so we're proud of that. I mean, um, you know, we it's the least we can do. Uh, you know, I try to think about every time they played the national anthem at a sporting event. You know, what does that mean? And it, uh, it's the people that are much tougher, much tougher than me and, and all of us that ha- that go to these foreign places and don't get any sleep and defend our country. So um, so that's that's kind of what it's all about. Do it during the summer when this when the sports is slow and uh, in redrockandblue.com is our website. And so that's uh, that it's 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 for the local military and. Uh, we have fun doing it. It's work. I mean, everyone that's involved in it has a full-time job, but, um, you know, it's the least we can do, you know, so we, it's rewarding. Where is you out, but it's reward, rewarding. Well, man, I cannot wait to get down to Louisiana, not only to hang out, see LSU kick some ass, take some names in the Kelly era, but then <laughs> to really hang out and go to one of these Red Rock and Blue events. I was, I've been wanting to go the last few years ever since I, I figured out about it. My father's a Vietnam veteran, so it's something that's very close to home, home, very close to the heart for me, and it's something epic. It's something that I just I salute you for doing it, Jacques. It's something that not too many people pay attention to the veteran cause anymore. And thank you so much for doing that, my man. You are a true, you know, true patriot in my eyes for doing that. We'll tell you, Dad. Thanks for his service. Certainly, he was part of a, a generation that has not gotten its. Just do obviously that that war was a controversial one, but everybody that went there did their job. So tell him thanks for his service, and uh, I appreciate all the kind words. Wow, he is going to be thrilled to hear that. I mean, I just remember Jack Besh, first time Jack Besh walked up to my dad. The first thing he says is, "Thank you for your service," because I he had already known. Just I said it in passing, like yeah. that just tells you the type of type of character of this team that I was kind of talking about earlier. But yeah, Jack. You're the man. Thank you so much. Have Lon, keep up the great work, man. Uh, you know, uh, keep hustling. Uh, you know, it, uh, you're doing a lot of great stuff. And uh, Makai Wingo and uh, th- those interviews that you've done, that's 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 cool stuff, man. That's uh, keep keep working hard. And, you know, you've got a full time job. You know, this is not unlike me. This is not your job, but you're doing an awesome job and putting out great content. So keep up the great work. Hey, every day I wake up thinking basically I'm doing a job where I have the time and the and the freedom to do this. So so I kind of see it as I have two jobs, three jobs with the baby as well. So it's just basically job after job after job, Jacques. But you know what? We don't we love to do this. 
And uh, Jacques, thank you so much for your encouragement in, in this whole thing and, and, and trying to trying to build this. And thank you so much for welcoming me to Louisiana when I got there. That was awesome. You bet, man. No problem at all. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Have a good one, Jacques. Happy you Thanksgiving. All right, man. Happy Thanksgiving.